We're now ready to continue our discussions in Chapter 27 and discuss the female reproductive anatomy. As I stated in the last lecture on male reproductive anatomy, the female reproductive system is going to be slightly more complex due to the interplay we see with uh, several different female hormones, but two really important ones specifically. Within the female reproductive system, we're going to focus on the ovaries as the main reproductive organ responsible for producing the female gametes known as the egg or ovum. The ovaries are also responsible for secreting those two important female hormones that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about, estrogen and progesterone. As we saw with the males, we're going to see several ducts and areas where once the egg is produced inside of the ovary, it must travel through these different ducts to get to the correct area. And then we're also going to look at the external genitalia of the female, which is a little more complex in the sense that it has slightly more parts than the male reproductive system. We're going to start with the mid-sagittal section of the female pelvis. This is one that you need to become very familiar with and be able to label for lecture as well as lab. When we're looking at this figure here, it's easiest to first begin learning the structures based off of where the egg or ovum is produced and then follow the path that the egg would flow out of the body. The egg is going to be produced here. This white structure represents the ovary. Now this picture is a little misleading, and I'll show you another picture in a second. The ovary is not actually attached to this large structure here, which is the uterus. It just looks that way in this picture. The ovary is to the side. Since this is a sagittal section, we have to also remember that there's stuff that would be out here we can't see, so there would be another ovary paired on the other side. Once the egg is produced in the ovary, it then travels through this long tube, tube known as the uterine tube, the fallopian tubes more commonly called. This does have several different parts. The beginning of the fallopian or uterine tube, these little finger-like structures are known as fimbriae. And then the other parts are separated. It's a little easier to show you that from a different view. Notice we have a ligament here. This is the suspensory ligament. This helps hold the ovary as well as the fallopian tube in the correct orientation. Once produced in the ovary, the egg travels through the fallopian tube. It is actually within this fallopian tube that if the egg is going to be fertilized, it will be fertilized by a sperm. If fertilized by a sperm, then the fertilized egg will travel and attach to the inside wall or the endometrial lining of the uterus. The uterus is a very muscular structure composed of smooth muscle. This big, thick muscular layer is known as the myometrium. And then we have this very thin outside layer known as the perimetrium. All of this represents the uterus. The uterus is held in place by several ligaments. We have the round ligament in front and then the uterosacral ligament in the back. And then not shown in this picture is something known as the broad ligament, which is a very large piece of tissue that helps hold everything in place. Any of you that have ever been pregnant, you may have um, had some pain fairly early on in the pregnancy that may have scared you a little. And if so, you asked your doctor about it. They probably told you you were having round ligament pain. That pain that occurs during the early stages of pregnancy is when the uterus is beginning to grow, it starts pulling on this round ligament. So you get some pains associated in the lower abdomen. If an egg is fertilized, it will remain within the uterus as the, the fertilized egg matures into a fetus and then grows into a baby. If the egg is not fertilized, then menstruation will occur. And during menstruation, the inside or endometrial layer of the uterus will be shed during menstruation along with the egg. The pathway that this is going to travel is through the opening of the uterus known as the cervix. If you are pregnant, this cervix is where the mucus plug is located to help wall off what's going on inside of the uterus. But again, if we're following the pathway of the egg out, out through the cervix, it will then enter into this canal known as the vagina and then out of the body. The outside of the female body has several different portions. There are two different labia, the labia major and the labia minor. The clitoris is an excitatory structure located here in the front. And then there is a gland here in the back located near the anus, but not, excuse me, near the vagina. But this is going to be not necessarily something really involved with most of the things we're going to talk about in this class. 
To point out while we're looking at this figure, I stated during the male reproductive system lecture that the urethra is shared between the urinary and reproductive systems of the man. Notice this is the urinary bladder. This is the urethra. It has absolutely nothing to do with the female reproductive system. That's why it's actually shaded out or faded a little in this picture. If we now move and look at this image, I think it's a little easier to see some of the structures we could not see in the last view. This is a view from the back side so that you can see that there are, in fact, two ovaries and two fallopian tubes that enter and go into the uterus itself. So these are your two ovaries. Then this entire thing is the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube has a few parts. We saw the fimbriae last time. Then we have the infundibulum, which is the portion that are directly attached to the fimbriae. And then we have the ampulla, which arcs or amps up. And then the small portion that goes into the uterus here is called the isthmus. So fimbriae, infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus. We can see in this picture the broad ligament that I was telling you about. It's this entire clear structure here helping hold everything in place. We can also see the layers of the uterus a little bit better. Outside layer is the perimetrium. Entire muscular part is the myometrium. And the inside is the endometrium. If you notice over here, this side has a cross section of the ovary. And we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail in a blown up picture here in a minute. Once the egg is released from the ovary, notice that the fallopian tube, the fimbriae, are not directly attached to that ovary. The egg is actually secreted into empty space, and then the fimbriae will move or wiggle like little fingers, producing a current that will pull the egg into the fallopian tube. Now let's talk about this ovary in a little bit more detail. As we look at the progression or the production of an, a mature egg or ovum or oocyte, several different names for the same thing, we usually use this picture. But understand that this picture is showing you a progression. All of this would not be happening at the same time. During the early parts of the monthly cycle of a woman, the ovary is going to be doing what sh we're showing in these top pictures or the top part of the picture here. At the beginning, all of these little primordial follicles, which a girl has from the point of puberty, they are going to slowly begin to mature. And you can see only one follicle will mature at a time. That one follicle will continue to grow. It will change a little bit. What is going on is you're beginning to mature the egg within each of these follicles, so it's slowly changing throughout the month. On average, at about day 14 of the monthly cycle of a female, ovulation occurs. Ovulation is when this follicle actually gets large enough that it is capable of secreting out the fluid with the ovulated egg. During the last two weeks of the monthly cycle, there are things that occur. Even though a new egg hasn't started preparing yet, we have to repair the damage that has occurred to the ovary by the release or rupture of this follicle that secreted the egg. So what we do is we form what's called the corpus luteum within the ovary. The corpus luteum is a scar tissue. The scar tissue is actually capable of secreting a hormone known as progesterone. This progesterone is going to signal the body that an egg has been released and it's time to move back towards the beginning of the monthly cycle. Now if we talk a little bit more about the different ducting system that the egg has to travel through, a lot of this I have already said to you while we were looking at the pictures, but just a few extra things. The uterus itself, as I said, is a very muscular structure. Its job, it, the reason it is inside of the female body is to provide a nice protective house for a developing fetus. It is more, it's natural for the female body to try to protect its egg and hold it in place. Now, the cervix, the opening of the uterus, is actually a pretty tough little opening for anything to move through. The uterus, the cervix and the uterus have to be firm and tough so that it can hold the egg and the developing fetus in place. This also kind of presents a little bit of a problem to the sperm. Remember, the sperm is going 
into the female body after ejaculation by the male, the sperm is trying to enter the female body and make it all the way to the egg. The sperm has to get all the way to the fallopian tube, so a sperm must enter in through the vagina and then make it through the opening of the cervix into the uterus. Within the cervix, there's all sorts of mucus and different things that are trying to block the way to make sure that sperm doesn't get in there until an egg is available for the sperm to get through. Once the sperm makes it through the mucus, it then travels through the uterus up into the fallopian tubes where hopefully it will find an egg. Sorry, the vagina itself is just simply an organ of copulation, or if pregnancy has occurred, it is a canal for the baby to use during the birthing process. The vagina does not actually have any other function. If we look at the outside structure, we can see the external genitalia a little bit better. This outer layer here is the labia major. Inner layer here is the labia minor. And then we can see, this is a small portion of the clitoris, the opening to the urethra, even though the urethra has nothing to do with the reproductive system, it is located here. And then there's the opening of the vagina. If we take away the outside layers of skin, this is what you would see on the inside of the female body. And I think this is just an interesting picture to show you because it shows you a close-up picture of the clitoris. And we can all look at this and tell exactly what the clitoris looks like because we just covered the male reproductive system. The clitoris serves some of the same functions on a female that the penis serves on a man. It's an excitatory organ. It is able to become engorged with blood during excitement and different things like that. It's just sort of an interesting picture to see. In the male reproductive system, we talked specifically about how a sperm is produced. And we reminded you that meiosis has to occur for the sperm to be produced. Just a real quick review of that with you. Whenever a primary sperm spermatocyte begins to develop, it is going to undergo mitosis, then meiosis, and then one cell becomes four mature sperm. But let's look at what happens during oogenesis. During oogenesis, you have the mitotic stages. This is going to occur only during early, early childhood. Something different between a man and a woman. A woman has a specific number of eggs at the point of puberty. She cannot continue to undergo mitosis after she hits puberty. That's it. She has all the eggs she'll ever make in her life. The man could continue to undergo mitosis his entire life. Once a woman hits, loses the ability or lacks any more little primary, primary follicles, any eggs to produce, that's when a woman begins to enter into menopause. But back to oogenesis, we have mitotic events occurring. Then eventually we begin to go into the meiosis cycle. Because the egg is a much more complex structure than the sperm, we see that when we have one of these little early stage oocytes, early stage eggs, they are going to then split to make a polar body and a secondary oocyte. Then the secondary oocyte is going to go undergo meiosis two, split again, and then we finally get the mature egg with three polar bodies. So one becomes one. With the man, one was able to become four. So it's a little bit different. This picture is also useful because this is showing you what's going on in a little bit more detail within that ovary picture I showed you during the ovarian cycle. Remember we had the little primordial early stage follicles? Those are just there. All women that have been through puberty have them. Once the ovarian cycle begins each month, one of those primordial follicles will become a primary follicle. This is when it's de destined to enter into meiosis. It then continues once the egg is completely matured, after meiosis 1 and 2, ovulation occurs. And then we have that corpus luteum, that scar tissue that must regenerate so that we can begin the cycle again. A new primordial follicle will mature into a primary follicle to begin the cycle. What I've been describing to you is properly called the ovarian cycle, which has three different parts. The first phase, which is here, when the primordial follicles are destined to become a primary follicle and we can 
begin to grow. That's what we call the follicular phase. That's when all of the follicles are going on. It usually takes anywhere from 1 to 14 days. The average is 14 days because at day 14 on average, ovulation occurs. That's when the mature egg is released from the ovary. After that, we have what's called the luteal phase. That's when we have the scar tissue, the corpus luteum, being produced. These next few slides just give you a little bit more explanation of what's going on within each of these cycles. Now let's think about what hormones are coming into play when this ovarian cycle is occurring. In the ovarian cycle, the most important hormones we need to think about during the beginning, the follicular phases, are the GnRH, the FSH, and the LH. What we're going to see happen is the GnRH is going to be released the GnRH release from the hypothalamus triggers the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. Once FSH and LH levels reach their highest point, that is when the ovulation is going to occur and the egg is going to be released. So we start seeing these raising levels of FSH and LH at day one, and they're just going to keep going up and up. Once they reach their highest peak, that's when the egg is going to be released. The more FSH and LH you have being secreted, you're going to start also seeing higher and higher levels of estrogen. Once you get a high enough level of FSH and LH, you get a high level of estrogen. That is the peak. That's the top or midpoint of the ovarian cycle, and ovulation is going to occur. Once you have reached the peak and ovulation occurs, you've had your surge of LH and FSH, estrogen is at a very high point, then you're going to see the estrogen, LH, and FSH levels go down. During the luteal phase, day 14 to 28, that's when you're going to see the progesterone begin to surge. So it's kind of an opposite effect. If I could get my, my little pen to work here. Let's see. Try to kind of draw for you what's going on. Okay. Well, no, it's not going to work. Sorry. Let's see. Oh, here I have a picture. Okay. So here we go. Nice little picture. Follicular phase, egg is trying to mature. Ovulation, egg is released, then corpus luteum. If we compare that to what's going on, at this point, let me try to kind of trace what would be going on with LH and FSH. So LH, FSH going up, going up, going up. We're at ovulation. LH and FSH have peaked. Then they begin to go back down. So the only place you would see the peak for the LH and the FSH would be at ovulation. If we look at estrogen, estrogen is going to start going up, going up, going up. It's also going to peak at the point of ovulation and go down. The progesterone will do the opposite. It will go up, go up, go up, go up. It will be up high, and then it will go down. Now if that's not confusing enough, Something else is occurring at the same time within the female body. We have what's called the uterine cycle, or what most people think of as the menstrual cycle. While the ovary is going through all of those different steps, the uterus is also going through different phases. During days one through five, that is the menstrual phase. During the menstrual phase, the endometrial lining of the uterus is being removed so that any leftover eggs or anything that hasn't been fertilized is going to be pushed out. If you think about that, that should make sense. What the ovary is doing at this time is preparing to release a new egg. So during this time, the uterus is preparing by getting rid of anything old so that when something new is produced, it will have a place for it. From day 6 to 14, that's what we call the proliferative phase or the pre-ovulatory phase. Let's see if I can go to a picture. There we go. During the proliferative phase, that's when the lining of the endometrium begins to rise again. If we compare that to what's going on with the ovary, remember this is where we're starting to see increasing levels of estrogen. So the higher the level of the estrogen, the thicker and the thicker the endometrial lining is going to get. Then we enter into the last phase, which is the secretory phase. We get really thick endometrial lining, and we're also beginning to start seeing our progesterone signals that are triggering, hey, egg has been released. We need to check and see if this egg has 
been fertilized to decide if we're going to start back over and go into the menstrual phase or not. Now, we're not really going to have time to go through what's all the steps that go through fertilization and pregnancy, but just for those of you that may be interested, how does the body know to stop at this point and not begin and have a menstrual cycle when pregnancy occurs? Because within the uterus, that's where the fertilized egg is going to be housed. So we don't want menstruation to occur if an egg has been fertilized. So what happens is once the sperm fertilizes the egg and we get a developing egg, a developing fetus, the fetus itself begins to secrete other hormones known as HCG. Those HCG actually will supersede all of these other things that are going on to block the menstrual cycle. Now we've been looking at what estrogen does to the female body as far as what it does in the ovary and what it does in the uterus. So we understand that estrogen is going to promote the development of the egg. It's also going to help promote the ovulation because the estrogen is high during ovulation. But estrogen does do other things. Estrogen is important for producing the secondary sex characteristics of women. It is responsible for helping take care of some of your normal calcium uptake, your normal cholesterol usage. A lot of women, when they go through menopause and they're no longer able to produce high levels of estrogen, they'll start having problems with their cholesterol. They may develop something like osteoporosis because of low calcium uptake, and all of that is because they're lacking this estrogen. So this can be a really complex hormone. With our progesterone, we saw that the progesterone was going to be produced by the corpus luteum. That's going to work in the kind of the opposite way of the estrogen. The high progesterone levels are going to prepare the ovary to get back to beginning, get back to the starting point so that it can produce or mature another egg. The female sexual response is slightly different from the male. Some of it is going to be similar. We're going to see it's going to be a parasympathetic reflex. The brain is going to cause blood flow to specific areas of mainly the external genitalia of the women, woman as, as also her breast. But whenever a woman achieves orgasm, it actually really has nothing to do with um, fertilizing an egg. The reason that the man has to achieve orgasm is for ejaculation to occur so the sperm can be released from the man and enter into the female body. But it, that is not something that actually has to happen for conception to occur in a female. 